This podcast may contain adult themes and triggering topics. Please be kind to yourself if you get triggered by what we discuss. Also, this isn't a substitute for therapy or counseling. Please listen to the appendix at the end for some of our recommendations for resources that will help you find a qualified mental health care provider. Now, we take you to a time in the near future where emotional abuse has been appropriately deemed a crime and the survivors find a home to reclaim their lives and freedom. This is Haven, and these are the stories of the Reclaimers. You're telling me this is an actual psychology term? I thought it was in reference to the book and film. The Wizard of Oz. I don't know that one. There's a wicked witch, and she's trying to trap a little girl. But instead of going herself, the witch sends these little flying monkeys. And the purpose of these flying monkeys is to what? Do the witch's bidding? Yeah. When a narcissistic abuser wants to get even more emotion from their victim, they groom helpers. Because of how cruel the helpers can be in service of the abuser, they're known as flying monkeys. Hmm. I'm going to need an example here. Okay, so after my lawyer served my abuser with divorce papers, I got a visit in the hospital from one of the abuser's relatives. What did they say? She told me that my abuser was in a lot of pain over the divorce and that she hoped I wouldn't report him. So she was your abuser's flying monkey? In that moment, yes, she was. Though she was in the midst of being manipulated by him as well. Huh, okay, I'm getting it. The flying monkey is also a victim. In many ways, yes. It's why now I don't hold any anger for my former sister-in-law. She was manipulated by her brother in very cruel ways. And after he was convicted? She came forward with other information about the coercive control and gaslighting he'd perpetrated against her and their other sister. But before that? They didn't know any better. Okay, so the abusers just manipulates everyone. Not necessarily. Manipulators and abusers don't treat everyone the same way, or everyone would be able to just talk with each other and confirm the abuse. So abusers treat some people really well, manipulate some people, and then abuse others. Worse, sometimes abusers will be idealizing some and totally discarding others. And this keeps victims blind? That's a big part of why abusers do this. Okay, all of this is fascinating, but I fail to see how it addresses the argument. Well, in order to recognize that I was abused, I had to allow myself to question why my abuser treated others so well, but treated me with so much disgust. Well, maybe it's just that I have a personality that can't be controlled, but I don't see how someone can be tricked by an abuser like that. Coercive controllers don't just come out and tell you they're abusive, Ben. If what you're saying is true... Anyone could be a flying monkey and not know it. Hell, (laughs) I could be a flying monkey and have no idea. Yes, that's part of what makes manipulated attachment and coercive control so terrifying, Ben. The deception is part of the abuse. So recovery requires awareness, which is really difficult to access when you're being lied to. Julia, how does this tie into that other term you used? Um, Triangulation. What is that? At one point while I was dating my abuser, he introduced me to his sister. After a great night together where she and I really hit it off as new friends, we were on our way home and my abuser told me that his sister thought I was conceited. I was devastated to learn that she wasn't as genuine as she appeared because, of course, I trusted my abuser's words at the time. It wasn't until much, much later that I learned he'd lied, so I would both distrust his sister, and so I would work extra hard to prove that I wasn't conceited. He wanted you to doubt yourself. Okay, forgive me, but isn't that just good, old-fashioned self-esteem? Why can't you just keep your sense of self in a relationship? Just make sure you know who you are, and then you won't attract manipulators. Oh, Ben... That's just as bad as saying that what a person wears causes rape. Yes, Meg. But let's try to address this a different way, okay? Ben, when you were at the Haven, you got a chance to meet Dr. Colossi, Percy, right? Okay, sure. I met her. Look me in the eye right now and tell me she is anything but the strongest person you have ever Uh, met. 
Um, sure. Cool. She's, she's pretty strong. And can you for one moment imagine her allowing someone to take advantage of her? Um, not sure. Simple. Does she have the kind of personality that sees through manipulation? <laughs> yeah, um, it's pretty hard to imagine anyone making her do something she doesn't want to do. And yet, she admitted you to the Haven as a survivor in residence? I, I plead the fifth. Oh, come on, Ben. We've all read the summaries released on livestream. We know that you were in communication with Senator Daniels. Okay. Okay, yeah. Why would Dr. Colossi admit you if, one, you were there under false pretenses, and two, she's the kind of person who can see through manipulation? Nice, Julia. Well played. Ben, I am keen to hear your answer. I can't answer that. <laughs> Could it be because you lied to her that she trusted Alcorn because you lied to Alcorn too? I will do just about anything in service of ensuring that there are no more victims. Even creating more victims? Low. Julia, come on, that was low. No, Ben, that's called holding someone accountable. And I learned that from my time at the Haven. I learned how to hold people accountable when they do toxic things. I learned how to expect better from myself, my friends, my family, my relationships, and from my community. And now you do expect better. I expect Ben to apologize for lying. I expect my mental health system to understand my trauma and provide resources. I expect my judicial system to understand how to deter future instances of predation. I expect myself to tell my story, and I expect our community to learn from the things I've been through so we can get better at supporting other victims. Wow. Wow. I thought the Haven was just a place for therapy. No, the Haven is so much more. It was designed to be so much more. Ben, I can see those wheels turning. What's going on in that brain of yours? All due respect to the brilliant model the Haven aspires to. We've known for some time that addiction isn't based on willpower, that it's more of a learning dis disability or, or, or a disease. I'll concede that much of what Julie is describing goes back to that research. However, we still haven't addressed the true danger of any addiction, and that is the substance itself. And in this case, the substance is a deadly predator. We have to get victims away from their abusers. We can't even spare a moment of this fantasy of consent. Julia was lucky to get away from her abuser who put her in the hospital so many times. Julia, sounds like we need to know that answer. What finally did the trick? What finally got you out? Dr. Colossi. What? I saw her interview about how most victims of coercive control aren't even aware that it's abuse. See? Luck. I concede that it was luck. What I don't concede is that violating consent somehow solves the problem. As I've said before, and as Ben has still not addressed, mm. victims who are pulled from their situation have triple the healing time and sometimes still return to their abuser. Unless the locus of control is given to the survivor, there's too much at stake to risk forcing a victim to get out. You want me to address that? Let's address it then, okay? How many months of safety could you have been granted if you were pulled out? I can't answer that. No one can. Okay. True. We can't answer that for Julia's specific situation, but I can show data regarding other survivors in Brazil where the justice system focuses on removing survivors from the abusive situation and holding them in a safe house while their abuser is held for rehabilitation. I assume you're going to show us some numbers, but we have to go to break. When we return, I'll discuss further solutions to the victim's crisis facing the Haven, and later we'll bring in a few of Senator Everett's classmates.
Hey, it's Percy and Feeney here. What you've just heard is a work of fiction, but we know that many listeners are living in a world of pain that isn't fictional at all. At the end of every episode, we're going to include an appendix of sorts. Some things we hope will serve those who live with a reality of fear and pain every day. First, we want to let you know about our website, www.empowering.tools, where we keep an ongoing list of books, websites, hotlines, and many other resources for victims and survivors of toxic relationships. Second, we love to hear from you. If you'd like to share your story with us or let us know how the episode impacted you, we'd love for you to reach out. These are deeply emotional things and we want to give you a chance to share. We're a small team, so an in-depth response isn't always possible, but we do read every message we receive. Third, if you're in crisis or you need to find an immediate way out, please call 800-799-7233 for the National Domestic Abuse Hotline. If your abuser is a parent or a non-romantic relationship, there are other resources we've listed on the website that are just for you. A reminder, emotional violence is still violence. You don't need to have bruises on your body to deserve help, and it's okay to feel what you're feeling when you call. Fourth, be safe. For some, getting out will take planning and time. If you know you need help, do what you need in order to safely get away. Lastly, we know how difficult it can be to believe there's hope on the other side of a toxic relationship. Many on our team know the devastatingly difficult steps it takes to get away from an abusive predator. But there is hope. You don't have to do it alone. If you don't have supportive family or friends, you can still find support at the hotlines we mentioned earlier or at a local hospital or shelter. Thousands of survivors have made it out. Getting out and reclaiming your freedom can be your story. We believe in you. We believe in your future. And And we we believe believe in your right to that freedom. freedom.